So I'm going to start out by, by asking um, Graham the, the brief version of how you ended up doing this kind of reporting. The book is an incredible mixture of portraiture of people who are in the middle of planning Islamic State strategies and, and, and attacks and terrorism. And it's a, a very deep a look at faith issues, the way that Islam has divided into different sorts of faith. It's a linguistic tour de force. Um, how many languages are you comfortable operating in? I think for the book, I, I had to interview people in about six or seven languages. And for example? For example, German, Italian, Arabic, Persian. Um, I could probably count more if I was able to flip through it again. I did need to have a, a translator for the Japanese, so well, things are tough all over. Yeah. <laughs> so there, and, and there's it goes deeply into the strategy too of how to think about this civilizational challenge, at least as seen from 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 the other side of the challenge, and what kind of responses Western society should make. So to begin, Graham, tell us how you ended up becoming becoming this kind of reporter and writing this kind of book. Well, I do what you do and what we all do uh, in this profession, which is going to find people, speaking to them, finding out what they say, and uh, trying to explain it, trying to interrogate it, be skeptical of it. And I found it in the case of ISIS in particular, um, there was remarkably few people doing that at the, in the early days of, of ISIS. And for some reasons that are easy to comprehend, ISIS was not exactly friendly to journalists, uh, especially if they came unannounced. Um, and one of the discoveries that, um, that I made early on in this reporting was that there were people from ISIS, people who were affiliated with ISIS, who ISIS had uh, in effect deputized as their spokesman outside of their territory. And if you went to them and you asked them the right kind of question, and the right kind of question would not be, when are you going to attack next, but who are you and what do you believe and how did you get to believe these things, they would talk back. And that's what I did. And so just to, to push back on that, there have been a number of strange places I've been over the years and asking people to tell me their story. Probably the strangest was with some of the Moro rebels down in Mindanao in the Philippines long ago. But usually there comes a time when if you are an American from, you know, from a reputable publication and suddenly you're in the middle of asking these people, why are you doing there must have been some suspicion and pushback from some of these people you were dealing with in times when you felt in danger yourself. If I met someone, it would always be in a public place the first time. And uh, it would, after a while, you know, I, I, I spoke to a, a, a pen salesman, telephone salesman who would sell um, customized pens. And he, he told me early on, if you can get them to ask you, the person you're, you're targeting for the sale, to ask you a question, then they might not buy from you, but they won't hang up the phone first. And it was very similar. If I could get an ISIS supporter to ask questions of me, then I found that, that the conversation would go on as long as I was willing to sit there because they would start to see me as someone they wanted to know more about and someone they wanted to pull into the orbit of their, their world. So Graham, despite his tender years, has just volunteered one of the two great secrets of reporting, which is to get people to start asking you questions. The other, which I'm sure you know too, is the power of silence. Most people are very uncomfortable with dead air. So if you ask a person a question, it gives you some answer and it's not that very good and you don't say anything, almost everybody will feel compelled to say more and more and more. I don't know whether that worked with the Islamic State people, but it works, works at least in the US. You know, most of the Islamic State people were chatterboxes. So <laughs> there was no problem with dead air. They had more to say than, you know, in the end, I would be the one who had to gently excuse myself from the conversation because they, they could go forever. <laughs> So I'm now going to ask you to tell about this, one of these uh, very uh, influential recent stories you did for The Atlantic about the American young man, also from North Dallas, who ended up being a very influential Islamic State leader. And I'm going to, to um, uh, introduce it by reading a paragraph that, that you have in your chapter about this man, John. When you say, Western jihadists find their way to violence by many different routes, but they often fit a broad pro profile. And that profile fit John, this person you're writing about, like a wetsuit. He came from a middle or upper middle class family. He squandered opportunities commensurate with his innate talent. He recognized that he would not, not excel in the fields chosen or glorified by his parents and authority figures. Often a personal crisis, a death in the family, a near death experience of one's own triggers existential contemplation and the meaning seeker behavior, the meaning seeking behavior that leads one to religion. 
In John's case, his childhood frailty, he had some physical illnesses, may have filled that role. And you go on to have some other uh, traits. Tell us about why it is that these upper middle class people, like uh, from, from your hometown of, uh, of Dallas, end up the circumstance, the story of John and the larger story of people like John. John is John Georgeless. He was born in 1983. Uh, he graduated from high school here in Colorado, in Colorado Springs, uh, at the Air Academy High School. His father is a colonel in the US Air Force, a, now is a practicing radiologist in North Dallas. Uh, so yes, John had a, a prosperous upbringing. And uh, he also had, was from, a, he was from a, a, a storied military family, in fact. I think his, his grandfather had been wounded twice in the Second World War had served in the National Security Council staff. Um, it was not exactly what you, you might stereotypically think of as the background that would lead to being a cleric in the Islamic State. Um, but as the passage that you read suggests, that, that there was a moment in his life where it's, it's almost as if he started to look back at the way that his ancestors had succeeded as war heroes, uh, as um, his dad was a high school football quarterback. And John, with um, frail legs, he had a, a, a tumor in his femur that caused him to be in a wheelchair for months as a high school student. It just wasn't going to work that way for him. And when he was casting about, at about the age of 19, you know, a normal type of, of adolescent uh, consideration of what, what path he might go on, he uh, happened upon the worst possible path. And uh, that's, that's, it's not exactly how every jihadist gets to that, but there is definitely a certain type, and especially a type that occupies a leadership position or that comes from a, a conversion background that he uh, represents almost in a, in a par paradigmatic way. And so step by step, how, what was his sort of a gateway drug and what did he do next and what did he end up doing? What's he doing now? Yeah, so uh, John George Liss was a, um, so he was flunking out of community college, Blinn College in Central Texas. Uh, and um, I hesitate to describe this as a gateway drug, but he walked into a mosque and he converted. And you know, most people who convert do not become terrorists, of course, but he really went down a very slippery slope by eventually just emailing his parents and saying, you know, my pickup truck, I, don't long, I no longer own it because I sold it to buy a plane ticket to go to Damascus. Once he got to Damascus, he learned Arabic to the degree that by now uh, you'd probably, he could probably pass as a native Syrian. And then over the course of the next decade, he became more and more radical, wandered the earth and joined different jihadist groups, got married, had some kids, was briefly incarcerated in the United States. And then on the very day that his probation expired, got on a, t on a, a plane to Egypt, landed in Cairo, and a few years later made his way to Syria and now probably to the city of Raqqa where he is, um, as far as I can tell, the top American cleric in the Islamic State. There is no other who is more influential than him. And how important is he in what the Islamic State thinks, does, and propagandizes? In English, he's extremely important. So at the very top echelons of the Islamic State, uh, there is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi who is an Iraqi. There are several Iraqis who we, we would put in the kind of executive office of, of ISIS. And then there is John Georgeless, who was writing for this magazine called Dabik, which is the glossy magazine that is sort of like the in-flight magazine of ISIS. And for years, it has now been, been producing uh, propaganda that, that has gone around the, the earth. It, it, is, it, is, it has fallen to him to, in a way, translate the ideas of ISIS to the rest of us. Uh, so he's been, in that way, very influential. I imagine the thought is going through the minds of many people in this, this room, or many Americans or Westerners, if they heard your description of John, they know some of their children or grandchildren who are well-educated, upper middle class or above, who might feel they're falling short in some way of their family expectations. What is it, is this just some aberration that you have this handful of people who've ended up translating those frustrations to ISIS? Is there some larger trend you see here? I think it, it really is um, the fact that he looks up at a particular moment and ISIS is what's in front of him. Um, of course, his conversion, the time when he became a dedicated jihadist was before the existence of ISIS. But it, 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 it does seem, seem to be largely random 
that he has chosen this particular path toward toward radicalism or toward meaning. You know, I, I, he is, I, I hasten to add, he's a brilliant kid, or he was a brilliant kid. He was highly, um, he, was, he was highly unsuccessful in the classroom, but as his father told me, he was much smarter than his sisters. He, he did way, way better on standardized tests, and yet he just couldn't get his act together. And I really think that if, if things had gone a bit differently, if he had found other channels for, the, for that, uh, that talent, then rather than being a senior cleric in ISIS, he would be you know, a professor of Islamic studies at Harvard Divinity School. That, that's the level of talent that he had. And he was, I think, simply thwarted in uh, finding an outlet for that that was uh, non-genocidal -gen and that was, was, was healthy. One more question on this, what might have been on John and the, the people like him. Over the last decade, the time since the 9-11 attacks, Americans have often hypothesized that Muslims and other minorities are basically better integrated in the United States than is the case in Western Europe or in the UK, and therefore episodes like this are less likely to happen to Americans either who start out Islamic or who end up converting than would be the case in Europe or other parts of the world. Do you basically buy that hypothesis or not? That's clearly true, yes. If you were to try to find an Islamic State supporter in London, you would simply go to a neighborhood where they were on the street corners screaming about how much they love the Islamic State. There are no that such would be your clue. That would be the, the first tip off. In the United States, there are no such neighborhoods. There are no such mosques. The, the Islamic State supporters tend to be in groups of ones and twos. They tend to have strong um, connections to outside the United States. So it's not as if they're radicalized by structural elements within the, the, the United States. And I think maybe even more than any of that, they're also simply well integrated. American Muslims are wealthier than average Americans. They are um, not ghettoized. They they you know they live as uh, as as just normal people among us who are our cardiologists, who are our bankers, and so forth. And if you were to uh, try to profile the average Muslim in France, you'd be much more likely to find someone who. Uh, first of all, was clustered in among only people who looked like him or her and who was uh, in Muslim communities and who certainly would, would be less likely to be your cardiologist than someone serving you a burger. How significant is the danger from purely hypothetical to something you worry about that a change in American leadership mood toward American Muslims would shift that terrain? I think there are enough structural advantages that we have that we're, we're pretty safe. That said, these things can change. I mean, if I were Muslim, I would feel less comfortable now than I felt six months ago. That, that's, a, that's, that's an easy call for me to make. And that is definitely what the Islamic State has been urging on Muslims to feel long before the Trump phenomenon, long before Islam, Islamophobia went mainstream. It was, uh, the, the message of the Islamic State has always been if you are Muslim, you cannot live anywhere else and feel a full citizen of, of that country. You have to come here. And of course, that's a much easier thing to feel now than it would have been before November. A fascinating thing about Graham's book is the way in which he clearly takes seriously the people he's writing about. And here's, here's why, why I, I stress that point. There's been a, a tone in um, Western political discussion of the Islamic State and other terrorists around the world of these people basically being losers, the ones who, who are, are ref, uh, taking out their anxiety, their frustration, their, their failure in life through violence as the only means that is available. And a very strong theme that you present is that these are, that the people you're profiling who are the leaders are quite formidable intellectual figures. I'm, I'll just read two passages again to support this. One is um, you're talking about uh, some of the, the, the ridicule of when they found some uh, terrorist who had been searching for Islam for dummies or something like that on the internet. So the subtext of these gloating non sequiturs was a desire to imagine the Islamic State's fighters as barbarians, incapable of a high-minded savagery that Westerners perfected in, say, the intellectualized totalitarian environments of Nazi Germany, or the Soviet Union under Stalin. And you go on to talk about the image of just terrorists as being essentially losers, which are different from the people you mentioned. I have to read one other brief profile of a man named Musa in Australia. This is a, uh, 
It says, when I arrived, who is one of the leaders, an intellectual leader of the Islamic State in Australia, when I arrived and saw Musa, I chuckled at my concern about being able to take him out in the restaurant. This was not a man who, go, uh, who goes to restaurants that require neckties. He was large, with a sturdy physique that will probably turn to jelly if he lives to, lived to see his late 30s. He wore sneakers and dungarees, cuffs rolled up, and a long beard that he sometimes stroke, stroked as if, were a Bond villain, as if it were a Bond villain's cat. Indeed, his facial hair made him look more like a fan of the Lord of the Rings at Comic-Con than a recruiter from the Islamic State. And yet you go on to say how, how formidable these people are. Tell us how you came to think these were actually serious intellectual figures and why it matters to think that. Yeah, so in the case of Musa, it was, it was very easy to see. There is a obsession with um, scripture with a, a particular type of reading of scripture that, that Musa and also John, by the way, who is Musa's teacher, uh, that, that they have uh, taken to, a, to a, an incredible degree. Um, this includes uh, a, a level of uh, linguistic autodidacticism that for me, as, as someone who enjoys languages myself, I could recognize in them serious students of this tradition. They would, um, you know, Musa would bring up to me uh, Semitic philology points that, that you know, it was, it was not common for me to have that kind of conversation with someone who didn't at least have something going on upstairs. And the more the conversation went on, the more I found that he was pretty much unstumpable on theological and legal questions within Islam. He came to conclusions that were different from what most Muslims would, would come to. They were, however, uh, ones that he could point to different points in the history of Islam when there had been the, the top scholars of the era who said this is the way it was. And then there was one other moment, one very particular moment when I thought, yeah, Musa is not just some fool on a street corner in the suburbs of Melbourne. And that was when I found one of his several uh, concealed Twitter accounts. And the handle on it was uh, al Kilauri, And I, I looked that up. It's not an Arabic word that I had ever seen before. Well, the reason I had never seen it before was because it was a word from Siculo Arabic, the Arabic dialect of Muslim Sicily in the Middle Ages, <laughs> and had not been used since then, and was attested in Google Books only in an obscure lexicon from Italy in the mid-19th mid century. So it meant the Calabrian, and it was a reference to his Italian-Australian heritage. So anybody who was able to, to mine the library in, at, at that, in that deep way, um, definitely w had to be thought of as at least someone who, who thinks. And I, to, to get to the second part of your question, why does this matter? Um, there was for a long time, as you say, that this, this, um, this expectation that the Islamic State would just be barbarians, that the appeal that the Islamic State was, was um, exerting on its recruits was one that was um, mostly for people who just wanted to see the world burn see their enemies bleed. They wanted to hack people's heads off. And I think that was probably true of some supporters of the Islamic State. But it was, in a way, the exact opposite of what it was for most of the people I found. And I think that this is true not just of the people at the highest intellectual echelons, but also for many of the foot soldiers. They had been convinced that the bloodletting was a step to something that was positive rather than believing in nothing or believing it solely in destruction. For them, it was the end game was building up something great and creating a utopia on Earth that would precede paradise in the hereafter. So this, there's some, leads to some questions about the intellectual rigor and other aspects of this view. For example, I'm thinking of other 20th century nihilist groups, not excluding the Nazis, not excluding um, Stalin, but think of, for example, the Khmer Rouge, or think of the Cultural Revolution in China, or think of the Taliban. And, and would you equate the Islamic State to any of those? I think of those groups as essentially being pure violence, pure nihilist violence by the time they were unleashed, of just tearing things down. And there might have been somebody saying, oh yes, it's against the bourgeoisie, but essentially it just became violence. Is the Islamic State, as you see it, like those or different from those? I think it's similar to some of them. So I, I would equate it, the, the Khmer Rouge, I think, is a very good analogy to the Islamic State. Um, in that, from the outside, it does look exactly as you described. My first reporting, actually, was in Phnom Penh. I worked for the Cambodia Daily. 
when the, the Khmer Rouge was, <laughs> was going on trial. Um, and so we'd, we would watch these people being brought out of the jungle, aged old men who ha had been, um, one, once upon a time, they had been graduate students in Paris. And they would describe their project in some ways that seemed um, high-minded, in some ways not. These, these um, motivations seemed to commingle pretty easily in their minds. And yeah, Pol Pot, Pol Pot was someone who, who had certain ideas that were current in the, in the time when he was studying in Paris that he was trying to operationalize. How many of his followers would have understood those ideas? Probably very few. I, I think the, the, the amount of, of um, percolation of ideas to the lowest rank of the Islamic State, probably higher than the Khmer Rouge or the Cultural Revolution. But we see in the same, in, in the same way as those two, we see a combination of ideas making a huge difference because of the people at the top who espouse them. And um, making that difference in part because of the political realities of uh, destruction of countries, of, of, of history, that have uh, in a way been the oxygen for the, for the flame where, where the ideas of the gasoline. And does the sophistication of the Islamic analysis and the world historical analysis and all the rest that goes in among the leaders of this group, does that convert to either strategic or tactical battlefield genius? For example, Osama bin Laden understood the reaction, or at least allegedly understood the reaction he could provoke from the United States through, through his attacks. Is there the same kind of uh, guerrilla genius or cunning uh, in the Islamic State? I don't think the Islamic State has been nearly as clever as some other guerrilla movements that, that have um, temporarily had immense success. Um, it, they, they were really staking their success on one thing, which is getting Muslims everywhere to think that they were the, the um, standard bearers for Islam. And they failed. They, they tried to tell everybody, you must come here. And they succeeded in drawing in about 45,000 people. So they, they really um, had a good run of it. Um, but in the absence of, of the sense that this is an obligation for all Muslims, as Muslims, then um, they will eventually fail. And we're watching that right now. In your most viewed item of all time on the internet, when you talked about what ISIS wants, you were describing some of the, the desire for a just all-out challenge between, uh, between Islam and, and the non-Islamic world. And in your book, you say, the Islamic State craves an all-out civilizational war. Conducted with the modern weaponry, that war would leave billions of people burned to death, crucified, beheaded, or shot in the back of the head, all over an irreconcilable dispute about the nature of God. Many of the Islamic State supporters I met openly longed for this war. So I ask you again, now two years after your article, what does the Islamic State want and how close are they? Is this still what they want? Has their desire morphed over time? How should we understand their, their ambitions? Yeah, you're right to point to the ways that, that someone with such an inflexible seeming point of view uh, can um, make it pretty flexible. Now, the Islamic State has changed in uh, tactics. It would be, of course, the first to say that it is following prophecy. These prophecies do not change. We might get them wrong, but the prophecies are still there, and we can still be the, the agents to cause them to come to pass. Um, what we do see with the Islamic State since the time that I wrote that article is a major shift in what it's calling on people to do. They still say we want to build up an Islamic State. We still want that state to be a caliphate that spreads over the world, etc. But they're saying now, what's the best way for you, a Muslim in Texas or in Paris, or in Dagestan to help out, it's to stay home and fight. Now back then in 2015, it was exactly the opposite. They said, don't blow yourself up, don't attack. Just try to get here, try to get to Syria. We need you. We need you no matter what your skills are. It was a kind of, of, of mass migration, a sort of leaderless crusade, or perhaps a, a uh, almost like a Spanish civil war mobilization. And they said, if you can get here, get here. And most of those people who tried were successful. The, the border was open and they got there. Then about one year ago, they sent a message that uh, was exactly the opposite. They said, if you can stay where you are, stay where you are and attack there because we wish we were you. We wish we were in Paris so we could attack there. And they think that by doing that, they're much more likely to cause that civilizational war to, to happen. 
but this sounds fundamentally more threatening from the Western world's perspective. There are downsides to having them stay at home and attack where they are. Um, now, on the other hand, think how few people have actually done that. I mean, this, is, this sounds callous to say, and I, I quickly add the caveat that it's tragic when the attacks happen. But um, the more I look at them, the more I study them, the, more I, the less I am worried about them, the less afraid, certainly for myself, for my own safety, and for those of the people in this room, the less worried I am. Um, I'll give you a stat. In 2015, as of 2015, the number of people killed per attack was 1.2. So this is, uh, it's, it's, it's dead bodies, it's tragedy, it's also pathetic. And the number of people they claim to be able to mobilize, they simply have not appeared in, in those numbers. And that should give us some degree of confidence about, about the, the success of the trajectory we're on. I'm going to give Graham 30 seconds to uh, take a drink of water and you 30 seconds to reflect upon what he was saying about this giving us confidence. And I'll use that airtime just to give my own view on this particular point, too. Uh, after the 9-11 uh, the attacks, I spent most of my time for the Atlantic over three or four years writing articles about how societies like the United States should deal with this kind of challenge. And I talked to a zillion experts on the history of terrorism and the theory of terrorism. And the point they all made is that even in an attack as horrific and damaging as a 9-11 attack, the real damage of a terrorist assault is always in the reaction it provokes. In the case of 9-11 attacks, that reaction was the Iraq War, the decision to invade Iraq, which did vastly more damage to the United States in lives lost, in cost, in all the rest, and the attack itself. And so the, the, what, what Graham is saying about the, the mental exercise of trying to keep in proportion what is horrific when it occurs without compounding uh, the, the, the damage by, by the, the, the response, whether it's fear, whether it's invasion, or whatever else, is it conscious on the part of the Islamic State people of wanting to evoke this, this uh, overreaction, or is it just sort of instinctive? And, and, and do they know they're doing this, or it just happens? They're, they're, they're it sometimes it. seems that they may have read your September 2006 <laughs> cover article <laughs> declaring victory about how we might um, deal with the inevitable attacks uh, in a, a, a wise way, which, which we have not. The Islamic State's strategy, I, I think, has, has clearly been responsive to the success we have had in thwarting Al Qaeda, so Al Qaeda simply failed to reproduce its 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 biggest attacks. You know, so the seven seven attack and the Madrid bombings are probably the the, the, the probably the only thing that that, that you know, we can easily remember since September 11 of attacks on the West. Now ISIS watched that happen, watched their um, former parent organization fail, and they the, their true innovation, I think was to realize that they didn't need to have big spectacular attacks like that to make everybody freak out. So they discovered that, okay, we could spend, as bin Laden bragged, he did $500,000 yeah. trying to get a few people into flight schools and maybe successfully take over an airliner and crash it into a building. We could also spend $9.99 for a good knife at Crate and Barrel and stab three people at a shopping mall and we will still get a three-day freakout on cable news. And we can do that over and over and over again, and we will never be thwarted because there will never be um, you know, background checks at Crate and Barrel. So that discovery really turned a lot of things on their head, and it meant that, that they could essentially never be thwarted. They could never be stopped from, from attacks. What they could do, um, the best that we could do, is to respond to them in a sane, reasonable way. We'll come back to sane and reasonable ways in a moment. I want to focus for a second on this theme of horror you introduced. Something that I, I, I forgot to ask you before is when you're talking about the intellectual erudition of the leaders of the Islamic State, the Islamic State has also been responsible for essentially the greatest publicly aired horrors we've seen uh, of modern times with the beheadings and all the other public killings. How does that brutality um, how do they rationalize that or justify it? How does that fit into the, into the high concept of the Islamic State as you understand it? Yeah, so uh, I, when I first started speaking to, to followers of the Islamic State, I, I would ask exactly that question. It's the most obvious question. 
how do you, as someone who has grown up in the West, as someone who has been taught that slavery, not a good thing, beheadings, kind of brutal, how do you rationalize that to yourself? And the answers were very quickly forthcoming. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll run through them. One is to say that there are certain crimes for which there is no other prescribed punishment in Islam. And these include apostasy. They include um, certain types of adultery. It, was, it, is, it is, we have no choice but to implement these, these punishments. The second one uh, is also scriptural, but of a different kind. And that is, they said to me, we have an obligation to terrify you. It's your reaction that we are commanded to provoke. And terror is something that the prophet commended to uh, his followers in, in battle time situations during his own lifetime. We feel like we have the same obligation today. The last thing is that they're drawing on a juridical tradition in the laws of war in Islam, which have traditionally offered four opportunities, four things you can do with captives. Um, and they are uh, to free them, not a choice that the Islamic State has frequently made, uh, to ransom them, which has happened a fair bit, uh, and then to enslave them if they belong to certain religions that are enslavable, and uh, finally to kill them. And in the early days of the Islamic State, they uh, got a kind of trifecta. They were able to uh, implement the prescribed punishments, terrify, and follow the, the traditionally uh, permitted um, by Islamic laws of war, fates for captives. And the reading from the prophet that you have an obligation to terrify your opponents, is that some kind of triple backflip, far-fetched reading, or is that a mainstream reading? It is not a mainstream reading in that most Muslims do not think of this as part of their religion. It, it, is, it is an accurate um, quotation of scripture, but an interpretation of that scripture that is weird and repulsive to most Muslims. The other aspect of horror, which you've alluded to, is the fact that whenever there is a knife attack in London, whether there's a bombing any place, a van runs into a crowd, these people were just sort of random slaughtering of, 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 of bystanders. Bystanders, the, the, all of the Western political and media establishment sort of magnifies this because we can all imagine if it were somebody, if you know, somebody we, we were, we, we, we knew, what is the, is it even conceivable that Western societies would react? Should Western societies react that way? Is it conceivable they could react in the other way? I think it would require a kind of leadership that um, I'm, I'm not sure we've even seen in my lifetime from a major political figure. You know, it's, it's one of the hardest things, you know, Jim, you were a speechwriter for a president once. How do you write the speech that says, there are a bunch of people who are trying to kill us uh, but chill out, it's not gonna be that bad. This is, this is one of the very difficult needles to Unless thread. You're, if you're a British prime minister, somehow you can give that speech more, uh, with more of a straight face. And th that's exactly what we yeah. need. You know, th there, there have been political figures and Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, was one of them. The London Bridge attack, I, I think, was one of the first attacks that I could name in the West where the reaction was uh, a um, more or less healthy one. Now. This is a horrible attack. People being stabbed repeatedly on the street by three, three men with butcher knives attacking lone women on the street. This is absolutely horrifying. And yet, the overwhelming response that you saw, especially once a couple hours had passed, was, a, um, was defiant. And even, perhaps even more important, uh, it kept a sense of humor about things. The, the most commonly shared picture, maybe some of you saw it, was a guy running uh, in a terrified crowd out of a pub, and he had his pint in his hand. He was not <laughs> spilling a single drop. And people, they shared this image because I think they were, they, were, um, they were tired of being terrorized. And it was a complete flop, this attack. I think the expectation of the freak out that would happen was not matched by the actual reaction. And that, that's something that happened perhaps for, as a cultural matter, perhaps because of leadership, but it's not something that we've, we've observed um, in this country. You know, now that you mentioned, I think that 2006 article in the Atlantic, I think I ended it with a hypothesized speech by a president about how you could recognize evil and not go crazy about it. I, mean, I, I think it's been a, been a long time. But it, as you think of American reactions to this kind of provocation, horror, evil, what are the best illustrations you can think of of either citizens or leaders 
responding in the brave way you'd like to see and not the magnifying terrorism way. I'm, I'm sad to say the only illustrations of this that I can give were um, on a micro level. I mean, I, I, was, I was an undergraduate student on September 11th, 2001. And I, I remember one of my professors when I went into to class the next day, not even mentioning what happened until the last minutes of class and said, by the way, you know, you, you may have noticed that we just lived our lives as we did, the, the, as we would any other day. That's what we need to do. That's the, that's the level of poise and equi equanimity that we would like to see on a macro scale. And um, I, as yet, we're not really seeing it with too much. And did that professor have a life story, you know, refugee from Nazi Germany or former protester or something would explain his or her sang -froid? Uh, th that professor had an interesting life story. He'd grown up in Beirut, and uh, his father had been a CIA agent. So maybe there was a certain amount of, of, of uh, sang froid that came from that background. So I have two more questions for you before I, I invite the audience to, to join in. Um, one is, at this Ideas Festival, this year and many years past, if you turn on any C-SPAN panel uh, any day of the week, you'll hear people talking about the dangers of the internet as the main uh, vehicle for transmitting terrorism, for recruiting people around the world. Um, how should members of the informed public think about the internet, you know, threat or menace? <laughs> yeah, I, I, as someone who, who enjoys the internet and has in a way made a living off of it, it, it I hate to say anything bad about it, but it, it has had some um, very negative effects in, in, in the space of online recruitment. They're just not quite the effects that people sometimes think in the context of the Islamic State. So the, the internet uh, is sometimes thought of as the gateway drug. People will go online and discover that ISIS exists. They will discover the, the message of ISIS and then be seduced by it and then go to Syria and fight. And it, it seems that that is not how it works. Instead, the way it works is people know someone directly in real life, a friend who's gone, there's some patient zero in their community who goes there and then the internet is what, they use, what, what is used after that person says, hey, I'm, I've gone over here, it's great, and if you wanna know more, here are a few websites. And then you can, at home, radicalize with materials that in the past would have to be passed around in a kind of covert way. So it's, it's, it's not quite as dangerous as it, it is sometimes um, painted as, but it, it's still an important aspect of this ecosystem that has driven so many people over there. And is there anything realistically or reasonably that could be done to limit that damaging effect of the internet? I would have said a couple years ago, no, it's the internet. What are you gonna yeah. do with the internet? But that's, that's false. First of all, um, social media companies, back in the early days of ISIS, remember they declared themselves as the Islamic State in mid-2014, not too long ago, um, back then you could say anything on Twitter about ISIS, about how great ISIS was, tell people how to get to ISIS territory, send them links, um, you know, give them advice on whether their kayak.com search was the right one to get them as close to the border as possible. And now if you are sending that kind of information out, your account will be terminated pretty darn fast. Mm -hmm. So social media companies, Facebook was ahead of the curve on this, Twitter caught up pretty fast, and now ISIS is reduced to using um, other tools like Telegram, which are not as well resourced as those other companies, and therefore can't have rooms full of people who are looking for radicalization. Um, the other thing that, that has been tried, and the data I don't think are quite in yet, is um, carefully returned searches. So if I'm searching for Islamic State fatwa, if I'm searching for Islamic State and also am looking for tickets to Syria or tickets to Turkey, then um, there have been attempts to, to, with a kind of judo of, of search, um, search engine judo, uh, instead return um, stories about ISIS that are negative uh, and the kind of stories that actually matter, not just saying ISIS does not understand Islam, but uh, saying to people, look, th these, are, are, um, these are some of the things about ISIS that you might not know that are uh, actually likely to affect your, your eagerness to go and join it. So here's my last question for you. Over the last, uh, from the end of the Obama administration through the current administration and in recent times among Western allies too, a major point of military strategy has been the war against the Islamic State. Is anything, are the efforts that a nation state like the US or other NATO allies 
are there military efforts? Can they make any difference? Can they do any good? Yeah, they can. Um, and I, I, I hasten to add the limit to what good they can do. The reason we're talking about ISIS right now, the, the ideas of ISIS have existed for a long time. And they've been sort of like hiding out in the body politic of the Islamic world in places where they could do very little damage. What has allowed ISIS to matter so much is this opportunistic infection on Syria and Iraq, which is caused by the Syrian civil war on the Syrian side and the misgovernment by the Maliki government in Iraq and ultimately the, the decision to, to occupy and invade Iraq in 2003. So the military side is able to make that space inaccessible to people who are trying to get there. And that is incredibly important. There are many people who might have ISIS on the mind, but who will do nothing about it because they can't get there. And that's great, that's, that's fine. It's, they're, they're, I'd rather they be thinking about other things, but if they're just thinking about it, then that might be the best we can hope for. Now, that though is that, that we could deprive them of those safe spaces, but uh, that's not gonna be the end of ISIS, of course. ISIS, as I say, it, it will infect opportunistically other places. Mindanao might be one example right now in the southern Philippines. So uh, it's, it's, it's not gonna be the end of it. It'll just be a way to manage it as which is what we should, should uh, aspire to. So we have opportunities for questions. And so a gentleman in the far back, uh, you have the microphone and then the microphone bearers will be seeking out subsequent questioners. Yes, sir. I find it interesting <laughs> given what you just said, I have probably got the right intonation to ask Graham the first question. <laughs> Graham, so John walks into a mosque what does he see there? What does he find that's unique, seductive, appealing, that he can't find elsewhere that causes him to stop going to Kmart, sell his pickup truck, and go to Egypt, if I may? Yeah, so the, the early days of, of John's radicalization, still not clear. I think there's a couple important data points here. One is that he went into the mosque soon after September 11 in central Texas. So this, let's just say it was a kind of a rebellious act. By going to a mosque, he was able to anger his parents, probably show that he was a rebel in, the way, in a way that was appealing to a kind of rebel, re rebellion-seeking personality. There's also, though, um, something we haven't, haven't mentioned, which is John um, was a self-taught computer programmer, and he had a, a kind of personality profile, a psych profile, that you see in a lot of jihadists. You know, there's a book that came out recently called Engineers of Jihad, which was showing that 40% of jihadists seem to have studied engineering or have a kind of computer science, hard, hard science background like that. Um, John, I think, was attracted to a particular kind of literalism that was perhaps available in a, shall we say, more legalistic religion like Islam than he could have found in the Greek Orthodox faith of his childhood. Um, and he just really went to town on that for the rest of his his career as a, as, a, um, as a cleric, he's been emphasizing a kind of almost like a computational version of Islam that is considered way out of the mainstream and that uh, ISIS is much more, um, much more happy with than, than almost any other version of Islam you could find. I feel way more informed than an hour ago, thank you. Yeah, so, yes, the, mi the microphone over here, yes. Do you think that these people that are in ISIS, and John in particular, are they capable of being suicide bombers following the? Um, yeah, well, I ISIS has used suicide bombing, bombing as its principal uh, battlefield technique. I mean, if, if you look at the way they took over large-ish cities in Iraq, like Ramadi, uh, they would wait until there was some cloud cover so that if there was any satellite assistance that was being given, then it would, it would be blind. And they will send um, as many as a couple dozen cars, suicide car bombs at a time. So yes, absolutely, ISIS was, is thrilled with suicide bombing. There is one strange footnote here, which is uh, related to the literalism that I mentioned uh, just a second ago, which is that the version of Islam that Musa and his teacher, John, both espouse, because of the literalism, they, they think that suicide might actually be forbidden. So they have a kind of minority opinion within the Islamic State legal apparatus that um, might actually say that you can't be a suicide bomber. And that way, we hope that they become more powerful. <laughs> Do you think he's doing it himself? Do I don't. 
So, so, for, so, so that the um, so uh, so the microphones over on this side. You have there are a bunch of people raising their hands in the front here. If you get one of them, what over here? Then? I attended a roundtable this morning about uh, Syria, and they were explaining. The speaker explained that the originators of ISIS were really middle class men who were dissatisfied were with a lack of freedom of speech and lack of economic mobility. I didn't hear you talk about that today. Is there any truth to that or how, how is that related to, you know, the fact that they just want to, you know, kill, you know, everybody who's a Christian or a the West or anything, anyone inconsistent with their religion? That certainly doesn't describe the, 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 the individual leaders of ISIS who we can identify. Now, it may be true that demographically there were middle class men who made up the, the kind of base of the foot soldiers in the early days of, of ISIS. But if you were to look at the people who are at the, we could say, the cabinet level of ISIS, they were people who, um, aside from a few who were Ba'athists and who were recruited to ISIS because of their military background and intel backgrounds, they tended to be people who have long histories of a kind of jihadi Salafi background. And freedom of speech is, to say the least, not very high on the priority list of, of jihadi Salafi. Yes, a microphone on this side, yes. Um, so, I was in London on the day of London Bridge attack, and I find myself just genuinely confused about what the right response is. I was in the center of the city, sort of walking back uh, a couple of hours after the attack, and I saw what you would see on any Friday or Saturday night in a city center in, in, in England, which is to say very, very drunk people throwing up on the side of the road and making out of each other, and you know. And yeah, in some sense, I found that heartening and inspiring. And in some sense, I found it really gross <laughs> because two miles away or an, a mile and a half away, people had been killed and they didn't seem affected by that at all. Um, and it leads me to this deeper ambivalence about what the right response is. Well, on the one side, I, I absolutely see the danger of overreacting um, and, and I recognize to what degree that is one of the goals of the terrorist networks. And on the other side, I find it to be something slightly glib in saying, well, we should just shrug our shoulder and retweet the guy with a pint, and that's it. And I think it may also underestimate the political danger within our own societies, that if a lot of the right-thinking, sort of center-left liberal people say, well, let's just not overreact, I think it also opens political space within our own societies for people who say, well, there's no political response to it, so I'll take it into my own hands. And we've started to see a little bit of that, even with sort of certain forms of domestic Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, and it, it, it is a danger. You know, it, again, this is why this is such a difficult needle to thread in, in terms of public and political communication. If you if you phrase it as, oh, you know, don't feel no, have your heart not not flutter for this poor woman who's been stabbed in the street, then of course that 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 miscommunication is going to be exploited to the nth degree by 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 your political opponents. So I, I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to do. I'm saying it's a very hard thing to do. And hard to the point where it's almost inconceivable that, I, I, that the leadership of this country right now uh, could do it. Yes, over uh, on this side. Yes, maybe in the front row. Thank you both very much. This has been re really informative from both of you. Um, are, you're a student of the Koran, it seems to me. Are, have you been Islamic yourself? Is that a religion that you have embraced? And the observation you made about Mao Zedong and in China in the 1950 and then the Khmer Rouge, they didn't have the basis uh, of something that was driving them like the Koran, and that made the difference in their really finally dissolving. And I just wonder if, if, if the, are, are they Sunnis? Are they Shiites? Do they see that as part of their distinction in any way whatsoever? And what is your take on that? I'm gonna uh, answer on Graham's behalf for a second. One of the fascinating things about this book is the, essentially the plot arc of the book is the effort of all these people to convert Graham, essentially. And then you're all saying, well, I'm not buying, but essentially the book is structured this 300 page effort to convert Graham, but yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I hope you uh, go to Amazon and buy the book to find out whether I was successfully converted or not. Um, yeah. Yes, um, I, I will say though that, that this, this long-term effort to flip me 
uh, is the same effort that they would give to anybody else in this room who asked them questions. They were, they were, they were trying to teach me. They were my teachers over the course of, of, of years. And uh, that's, that's, that's really what the, the book is a record of, is all the ideas that they had, all the, uh, uh, all the attempts that they had to uh, give counter arguments to the obvious ones that I had as a non-Muslim, as a human being, someone who believes in the dignity of humans as humans. And their um, rather impressive um, mobilization of scripture to answer the, those, those uh, objections. They were, they were pretty good at it. Yes, on, on this side, we have a microphone. Oh, oh yes, oh, go ahead, yes. Well, can you speak a little bit about the role of 24-hour news media and ISIS and how it can maybe affect ISIS's uh, behavior? Yeah, so uh, ISIS watches the same news that, that we do. They know what the responses are and they calibrate what they do accordingly. Um, now, I wanna speak a, a little bit in defense of 24-hour news, um, and I do this from a position of some ignorance. I don't watch 24-hour news, and I think it's a poor way to get your information. There was, though, a period when um, ISIS um, was doing things that we hadn't really seen before, that other, other groups had done things that were equally savage. They just hadn't had the same film crews present and hadn't said openly, we're doing this. And I, I think 24 hour news and everybody else was, were at a loss as to how do you report on this in a responsible way. And the good news about the news is that we've become a bit better at that and more responsible. So in the early days, it, was, uh, it, it seemed reasonable just to show someone being beheaded as ISIS wanted us to. And now, um, don't think that that's actually adding anything to the to the reportage. There's um, you know, it sometimes doesn't seem this way, but there does seem to be a, a learning curve. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes, over here. Yes. Can I ask you where do you see ISIS in two years, five years, and ten years? All right. Well, um, I, ISIS. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll conflate some of those years uh, <laughs> into into just saying in the future, I, you know, <laughs> ISIS has been losing its territory really fast. That's good. They've also been respawning elsewhere. Um, I went la at the end of last year to Mindanao, where ISIS has really planted its flag firmly in the ground in the central city of Marawi. Um, that is sort of what they're attempting to do now. Is when they lose their territory finding other places with pre-existing dissatisfaction, long-term political uh, upheaval, and if possible, an Islamic inflection on that upheaval. And once they find it, show up and say, we can unify all of these Muslim groups. Jim mentioned the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. They definitely would go into that base and say, look, we've got a way of doing this that was pretty successful for a while in the Levant, and we can replicate it here. So that's what we're gonna see, is ISIS attempting to respawn in southern Philippines, in the Sahel, in Somalia, in the Horn of Africa, anywhere where there is this constituency of people who are looking for some type of, of binding element for warring factions that are, at the, that are um, all in some way Muslim and think, that, think in, in effect that the problem has been, we're, we've been fighting amongst ourselves so much that if we all come together under one caliphate, then we'll, we'll have a future. Here's what I'd like to do. Let's, let's get out on the table the three or four or five questions that are in the room. We'll, we'll ask all the questions sort of back to back and Graham can respond as he is able. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you both. Um, as a Muslim, American Muslim who grew up in the Midwest, um, I have been you know, attending religious um, school my whole life uh, or as, as a child went to mosque growing up, um, came from a fairly religious family. 9-11 um, happened when I was in high school. And um, I feel like since then, my community, my family, my husband works for a foundation that um, supports Muslim leaders in this community. And it feels like since that time, the community itself has been focused on how do we, how do we condemn terrorism in a way that we're heard? That like the, the voices of our community are heard by you know, people who we live among, our neighbors, who, you know, know us as, as hu human beings we are, but then sort of turn on the TV 
and see an image and then immediately begin associating it with us. And so I guess the question is how, how, do, we, how do we make that message right. heard? Um, Great, thank you. So don't answer that yet. We'll get a number of other questions. Yes. I don't understand, given the initial success of ISIS with territory and ideology, why did they make enemies of everybody? Why did they, why did they embark on this campaign of beheadings, and et cetera? Uh, good, I'm writing these down to remind you. Yes. Um, so a question, comment, and Brandon, And how about you. the question, yeah. <laughs> um, I appreciate your cultural insight, which is extremely important. Um, I think every country is different, and how we interpret that um, is really important. And seek to understand not to be understood, and I think that's why we need to educate and communicate people. Um, I used to think that the jihadism dealt in our country with um, people that were poor or that's where they would basically draw them from. And from what you said tonight, it's, it's not that. I mean, we're all susceptible to it. Um, I do have questions as to how effective ISIS is in taking our young people that come from different backgrounds and they recruit them. Great, thank you, thank good, you. thank you. Yes, okay, so we have like maybe two more, yep. Hi, I'm curious if you ever fear for your safety or if there's been an incident that made you more fearful or do you think they're just too busy trying to recruit you and sort of get their message out when you speak with these terrorists? Okay, how about one more question? Who has a microphone? Yes, you, you, you can project. Or, or. Great, about Saudi Arabia, and yes, somebody has a microphone for the last, yes. And then I'll, I'll remind you what these are. And you can Thank you. Good question. What do leader, what skill sets do leaders need to learn real, real fast yes. in terms of response to this? Fine. So, so just as a reminder, thank you for these excellent questions. I know there could be a hundred more, but sort of the, what's the most effective voice of the American Muslim community? Why did the Islamic State make so many enemies so quickly? Uh, what's the sort of changes in the draw from the American population? Are you fearful for your own safety? Uh, moving to Saudi Arabia and the appropriate skill set for dealing with these challenges. You may answer any of these you choose. <laughs> I, I will try to go through all of them in a lightning fashion. Good. But the first question about what Muslim communities can do, um, I, I've got to the point where if people ask me why do Muslims not commend, or do not, excuse me, condemn terrorism, then that's, that's simply an indication that the person has not been listening. And it is not possible for Muslims to correct the, uh, the the beliefs of people who simply aren't listening to what they're doing. So I would first of all think, I first of all think that it is, it is not your obligation as a Muslim to be um, correcting the, the, the misimpressions that people have. Um, there are um, community building exercises that, that, that the Muslim community is engaged in. I hope that those continue. I think those are important, but I, I, I don't think first of all that the burden is on you. Um, the next question. Next question is why do they make so en so many enemies so fast? What with all the beheadings? This is the answer to this is the Hail Mary pass. Um, they, they believe that what they need to do is get every Muslim on their side. They want to separate the camps of, of true Muslims from non-Muslims and from Muslims who are, are Muslim who are not actually Muslims. So the only way that they could do that was to have a huge blitz of propaganda. That includes the beheadings, that includes everything that they were doing in the early days that was horrifying to everybody because they thought you need to get enough publicity to do this right so that everybody comes on our, on our side. We don't win this war through a, a slow uh, process of building up a, a, a state over the course of 200 years or so. We do this by getting everybody to, to flip over and, and, and migrate. The surprise factor that the draw is not from the dispossessed of Western society, but the, the middle class and above of Western society. I think we have to understand the complexity of this relationship between poverty, opportunity, politics, and, um, and the drive to join the Islamic State. 
there are, in the cases of people like John Georgeless, it's clearly not poverty. It's clearly not lack of opportunity in the normal way. But there are many people who I think it's very easy to see how when they look at the opportunities in, in, in front of them, um, they don't see very much. And ISIS offers them glory, offers them fun, joy. It offers them um, a fulfillment of, of their identity uh, in a twisted way. So that's, it's, it's not completely unrelated. Um, it, it, I think to, to disentangle those things requires uh, a, a, quite a few steps. Your own personal safety. Uh, you know, when I started speaking to someone for the first time, I would do so in a public place. I would make sure that I was talking to him or to her uh, in a place where I would have a fighting chance. Uh, and after a while, I, I came to realize that, especially if I was asking the right questions, it was as if a compulsion seized the person I was speaking to. And they had to give me the full spiel. Uh, and usually they would say, you know, stick around, have more pizza. So most of the time I, I felt in danger of being overfed. <laughs> so uh, ISIS moving to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is the great prize for ISIS. That is true. Um, they have had um, for a long time a series of bombing attacks, mostly against targets that are associated with either with the state or with the Shia minority in Saudi Arabia. They've been trying at that for a long time. Um, Saudi, the Saudi government seems to have got at least a bit of a handle on this, and those attacks have mostly ceased. Now, um, this is going to be complicated, though. What ISIS hopes it can do in the case of Saudi Arabia, they realize that Saudi Arabia is a friend of the United States, a personal friend now of Trump, too. And what they hope to do is to take advantage, I think, of maybe, maybe an Arab Spring-style revolt. That's, I think, the, the, the kind of miniature Hail Mary pass in, in this case, is capitalizing on dissatisfaction in the kingdom, perhaps related uh, to lo the low price of oil, uh, dissatisfaction with the Saudi royal family. And once there is enough chaos, to be the ones who step in and say, give us a try. And finally, the ideal skill set for the leaders we want and need. Ooh. Um, so I, I've, I've mentioned multiple times now a, a, a kind of skill at political communication coupled with moral courage. Um, these are, I think, the, the, the first things. There's also, though, um, something that I, I, I wish we had seen um, in our previous president, which is a quicker apprehension of how these groups change. Al-Qaeda had been um, using st strategies that were in some way similar to ISIS, that were headed toward the same um, destination that ISIS uh, was considering. And ISIS flipped so many of the strategic elements on their heads. And um, I think it took us collectively probably about a year, year and a half to notice that that had happened. So um, being a, a, perhaps a bit more intellectually spry and nimble in, in that department would have been, would have been nice. So go out and buy and read Graham's book, The Way of the Strangers, read his articles in The Atlantic, and join me in thanking Graham Wood.